when you think of summertime, you think of beaches, boats, and just sitting outside with a glass of chilled wine. If you're like most people, you want to cool off and refresh yourself by sipping on a white wine or a rosé with your friends or pairing it with a fresh salad or seafood. For white wines, most people go for a Chardonnay, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Riesling, or even a Pinot Grigio. But what's interesting is that none of those wines are Italian, not even the Pinot Grigio, which I'll explain in a second. Why is it that the most popular white wines in the world are not Italian, like none of them? I mean, after all, isn't Italy in the center of the Mediterranean, the epitome of hot weather and paradise? I mean, don't the Italians in Italy need to cool off? I mean, who wants to drink a heavy red when it's 100 degrees outside? Unless, of course, you've got the AC on high. But are the Italians in Italy, are they drinking Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, or Riesling? The truth is, very few. They're not drinking Pinot Grigio either. That's because Italy has their own white wines. What do I mean by that? Well, Italy has the most diversified selection of white wines in the world. There are hundreds of different grapes used for winemaking that are native to Italy, they only grow in Italy, and you won't find them anywhere else. They're authentic Italian, and they're uniquely delicious. So if you wanna feel like you're in Italy while sipping on vino in your backyard, you've come to the right place. My name's Tony Margiata, and you're probably wondering who I am and why I'm sharing my summer Italian wine tips with you. Let me just share a quick story about that. My father, my grandparents come from a small village in Southern Italy called Mondacquila. It's part of the Molise region. They came in the 1970s. And fast forward a few decades, my grandmother passed away unfortunately in the year 2000. But that was what sparked my very first trip to go to Italy. Uh, our whole family actually went to Italy to meet our cousins, our aunts, our uncles and I fell in love with Italy on that first trip. And for the last 20 years, I have been going back there every summer to visit my relatives. Um, it's a very small mountainous village of a thousand people. So what I would usually do is pack my bags from New York, go to Montacquila, drop off my bags, say hi, hang out for a couple of days, and then I travel up to the north of Italy. I went to Florence, Venice, I was in Piemonte, Lombardia, Veneto, I went all over. Um, I went as far down as Sicily uh, on some trips, and I just fell in love with the food, the wine, the culture, everything about it. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, I'd have these amazing food and wine experiences in Italy, and then when I went back to New York, I'd rush to my local liquor store, still high on that trip that I just came back from, and I bought a bottle of Italian wine, and nine times out of 10, I was disappointed. The wine, no matter how much money I spent, whether it's 15, 20, 25 dollars on a bottle of wine, I, I was not wowed like I was when I was in Italy. You know, was it the ambiance? Um, I don't think so. Some people would argue yes. So I got curious. I started studying wine. I bought tons of books from Kevin Zarelli to Jancis Robinson, everything in between. And you know, while I picked up tons of info about wine, I was much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about wine. I still found myself drinking sort of mediocre wines compared to what I was finding in Italy. I mean, even the house wines in the Italian restaurants, the ones they pour in the, in the glass carafes, those were better than anything that I could find on the shelves back home. And so that was actually one of my first clues about good wine that I didn't realize at the time. I used to ask, uh, as I got more curious, I used to ask the hostess, the waiter, or uh, the owner of the restaurant, you know, who makes this wine? And they always gave me a vague answer for some reason, and I was not sure why. They always said, local producer. Very vague. Well, these local producers turned out to be smaller, lesser known vineyards with very little exposure to the American market, uh, but they were all very well respected in their local town, their local area. So I opened up an importing company called Gladiator Wine to support these smaller vineyards. I knew that being like the new kid on the block, another wine importer, I had to introduce myself with a 
exceptional winery on the very first try. Otherwise, I figured no one would ever speak to me again. So with that said, um, I decided not to look for wines in Tuscany or Piemonte because those were the most popular wine regions and they're so commercial and they're so densely populated. There's so many wineries there. I decided to look elsewhere, um, an up and coming sort of region in Italy, and that was Sicily. So I began calling smaller vineyards in Sicily, asking for sample packs. They'd ship me the sample packs and I would be tasting different wines. And honestly, uh, the wines were mediocre, nothing any better than what you could get on the shelf. And they weren't, re they weren't really uh, as good as the wines that I was tasting at the local restaurants when I was traveling. So the very first thing that I learned right away was that just because the vineyard was smaller and lesser known did not mean that it would be any good. So I ended up picking up this book called World of Sicilian Wine by Bill Nesto. And he researched all these native Sicilian grapes only grown in Sicily, can't find them anywhere else. And they had unique flavors and textures and aromas. And I really wanted to taste these wines. So he listed some wineries in the book and one of them caught my attention called Castel Luci Miano. And so I contacted the winery and they sent me a sample pack and I was blown away um, with all their wines. But since this is a white wine class, their white wine was off the hook. So I went to visit them and that's what you're seeing in this picture here. Um, I wanted to taste these wines again and see the vineyards. So uh, what you're seeing right in the picture is, uh, is my visit. And, you know, I was uh, the director of the winery, Piero, who is also in that picture, uh, took me on the tour. And I asked him because I had noticed there was a larger, well-known winery uh, who was right down the road. And their wines are in just about every liquor store in America. So I, I asked him, I said, you know, why are your wines so much better than their wines? And he simply told me, we harvest by hand, they harvest with machines. So that was the aha moment that I was looking for. So I did more research and I found that the majority of wines in your local wine shops are mass produced. So the key to drinking the best wines all seem to have hand harvesting as the common denominator. So I brought in my very first white wine from Sicily and I was shocked when it won double gold medals and best white, uh, you know, best white wine of the year at the New York International Wine Competition. It beat thousands of entries. So from that point on, I knew it was onto something. Um, and since then I've been importing more wines uh, wines that I call artisanal or craft wine from Italy, and I'm going to share several of them with you over the next 30 minutes. I also wrote a book called Hidden Gems of Italy, which is sort of a part fast guide, part crash course, and part shopping guide, how to find the best wines in your budget that are authentic Italian wines that are 20 to $25 in the wine shop that tastes like $50 bottles of wine. So in brief, over the next few minutes, these are some of the topics we're going to cover. I promised you that uh, I would share with you some summer Italian wine tips. So we'll go over what are native Italian grapes. I'll share with you six authentic Italian white wines that you should know. How to master Italian rosé in five minutes, which is very exciting. And then I'm going to share with you nine Italian food pairings with white and rosé wines and finally how to find the best bottles for the summer. So what are native Italian grapes? Well, just like earlier I had mentioned Cabernet, uh, not Cabernet, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, um, uh, Pinot Grigio, these are actually all French grapes. Yes, even Pinot Grigio is not an Italian grape. Um, it comes from France, it's called Pinot Gris. Chardonnay, uh, one of the most famous white wines in the world today, actually originated from France. Countries all over the world today are growing Chardonnay grapes and making Chardonnay wine, but it's a native French grape. Italy has an estimated 2,000 wine grapes, um, including reds as well, but there are hundreds of different white wine grapes. And 
you, you should care about these for, for this reason. There's a geological relationship between the soil, the climate, and the grape that when they work together, they produce under, under the, you know, under the guidance of a skilled winemaker, a unique wine, distinctly delicious flavors and textures and aromas that are going to be so different from the commercial Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs that we're all exposed to in our local wine shops, that it will totally change the way you taste, the way you look at uh, Italian wines and wines in general. It's a very, very uh, enriching experience. And so these grapes have been growing in Italy for thousands of years. So there's a long history and a long relationship. And it's really the local people, these local regional people all over the country that keep these grapes going. Even when they're not popular, there are farmers that are dedicated to these native grapes. And as I had mentioned, Italy has a couple thousand different grape varietals, but worldwide there's an estimated 8,000 different grapes used for winemaking. And this map is basically a picture of the New World wine producing regions in green and the Old World wine producing countries in orange. Uh, old World wines are for, you know, uh, sort of the cliff note version I'll give you right now is that this is where wine comes from for the most part from Spain all the way into the Middle East. And so Italy has an estimated quarter of all the world's wine grapes. That's a lot coming from just one little country. And that's because Italy is located in the perfect place on planet Earth for flourishing and cultivating wine grapes. So um, in the next few minutes, we're going to explore Italy a little bit and some of its whites and rosés. Um, this is a regional map of Italy. There are 20 regions in Italy. You can think of them as 20 states if you like, and each region has their own local native grape varietals. And we're going to explore four of those regions today. Sardinia, the island, the other island that we really know, Sicily, the region of Campania in the south, and then Abruzzo in the south central area. Code word for quality. A picture tells a thousand words. Um, on the right hand side, you have a tractor uh, machine harvesting the grapes. They are picking all the unripe, the ripe, the sour, the rotten, everything you can imagine. They're picking all of these grapes. They take it to the wine cellar. They might try to separate it, they might not, who knows. Um, they try to chemically alter the wines using, they have access to up to 72 additives in the US. There's up to 56 additives in the European market uh, to alter the wine and to make it drinkable and tasty. You can produce millions of bottles a year uh, this, in, you know, this way. Now on the left-hand side is the artisanal way of winemaking, which is hand harvesting, hand selecting, the best grapes at the perfect moment. You can't make a lot of wine this way, as you can imagine. It's, there's a lot of work involved. So all the wines that we're gonna taste um, in this class have been made less than 50,000 bottles a year. That's a big, big difference. Just to give you perspective, Yellowtail, one of the most popular wine companies in the world, makes 100, over 120 million bottles a year the last time that I checked. That's a lot of wine. How do you make 120 million bottles all taste the same? Um, hard to imagine. Let me show you another picture. This is a mass produced vineyard. And as beautiful as it is, you can see it's, it's perfectly designed for a tractor to harvest the grapes. Um, this is not uh, the type of wine that I'd wanna support. Here's another picture of a tractor machine harvesting the grapes. Um, th these are very hard to find, by the way, these kinds of pictures. They don't want you to see these pictures, believe me. Um, here's a tractor spraying the vineyard. This is what I'm looking for, just scissors and hands. This is the best way to make fine, clean wine. And very quickly, uh, this is in Italian, but it doesn't matter. 
um, on the left-hand side, you have a conventional bottle of wine showing you all the potential additives and chemicals that can be found in a regular bottle of wine versus an organic one. So for those of you who are all about uh, organic wines, um, unfortunately, while yes, uh, there are less additives available for an organic wine, you can see there's still many of them that can be used. So um, I would say if you're getting headaches from wines, it may not be the sulfites. Unfortunately, the sulfites get uh, the blame for all of it. Um, and just as a disclaimer, I am not a doctor. So, you know, if you've been, um, if your doctor tells you you have an allergy to sulfites, um, uh, you, you have an allergy with sulfites, that's fine. Um, but, you know, consider the fact that all these chemicals that are found in commercial wines might, you know, be contributing to the infamous wine headache because sulfites have been in wines for thousands of years. There's more sulfites in a can of tuna, in fact, than there are in a bottle of wine. A conventional bottle of wine has about 120 milligrams per liter of sulfites. The wineries that I work with, they, are, they have about anywhere from 10 to 40 milligrams of sulfites, which is a third of it. Um, the big producers, they just, they need more sulfites because they just, they have a lot to lose if uh, they end up shipping out a million bottles that are going bad. Okay, here's the first region and our first wine that we're gonna explore. We're gonna go to South Central Italy in the Abruzzo region. Now, uh, Abruzzo is a beautiful region. Um, on the east side of it, you have the Adriatic Sea. This is a picture of a beach town called Vasto in Abruzzo. But Abruzzo also is called the greenest region in Europe because it has more national parks that are protected than any other region in Italy. So if you like nature, you like hiking, you like mountains, Abruzzo might be a good place for you to go. Uh, this is a picture of me on one of my trips to Italy, and this is Vasto uh, right behind me. And I was actually uh, in Vasto meeting with some people in the wine business. I was looking for some wines in Abruzzo, and uh, unfortunately, I was unsuccessful. I didn't find anything that I liked. I was searching for a Montepulciano d'Abruzzo um, and possibly... Uh, some some white wines, but I, I was unsuccessful on that trip. I found nothing, so I, not that I didn't find any wines, I found some wines, but I, I, I didn't like what I found, so I decided not to bring them to New York. It wasn't until a couple of years later, I went to a trade show up in Northern Italy, and um, these are my new friends from Abruzzo, two sommeliers from the region, and that day I must have tasted over 70 different Montepulciano de Bruzzos, which is a red wine, but uh, I'll get to the white wine in a second. Um, and I ended up finding this one red wine, a Montepulciano, that really caught my attention. It really stood out from all the others. So aromatic and smooth and natural tasting. Um, I asked these ladies, who was this person? And they told me his name is Emilio, Emilio Rapino. And they said, you know, he's a very, very, uh, uh, he's a winemaker with very high integrity and that I should go meet him. So I did. And this is Emilio here. And Emilio um, is the third generation uh, to own and operate the family vineyard, the Rapino Vineyards. And um, he is the first winemaker in his family to be a certified enologist. So he went to school to study enology but he's also a very hard worker. He works out in the fields and does all the vine training himself with a couple of other people to help him. He's very dedicated, he's very passionate about the land. Um, he has a very unique vineyard. It's located uh, on the Adriatic coast. On the west side of his vineyards, you can see the Apennini Mountains. You can see they're covered in snow. And on the east side of his vineyards, you can see the Adriatic Sea. So it's a very, very unique place of origin to be cultivating grapes. So uh, long story short, 
he also makes a very, very nice white wine using the Trebbiano grape. Now, Trebbiano is one of the most cultivated white grapes in all of Italy. It's made from the north to the south. Sometimes it comes under different names. But Trebbiano was historically a blending grape, and it was found in many, many white table wines that were exported to the United States and elsewhere uh, for decades. And it wasn't really known as, as a quality wine. They, they discovered uh, not that long ago, no more than 20 years ago, they discovered that if you lowered the yields and you grew less grapes per hectare, the quality of the Trebbiano grape goes up quite a bit. And so that's what Emilio does, um, lower yield Trebbiano wines. Uh, so this is his Trebbiano d'Abruzzo. This is our very first white wine. Uh, the reason I'm introducing this wine first is because it's probably uh, the softest, most delicate, easiest uh, white wine to drink. If you were going to have a, a cocktail hour or aperitivo in Italian, you know, to have a nice glass of white wine before dinner, this would be an excellent, excellent choice. But it's also equally excellent to have um, with food or without food. I paired it with uh, uh, breaded flounder. So because the wine is, is fairly delicate, you want to pair it with a delicate white fish. I wouldn't pair it with tuna, a tuna steak, for example. Go with something soft and delicate like a, uh, a flounder filet. And then I just paired it with some veggies. There's an orange pepper, cauliflower, and asparagus. Um, what does it taste like? Depends uh, from vintage to vintage, which just goes to show you how authentic this wine is. Every new vintage tastes different from the other. That's how you know you're tasting an authentic wine. The fake mass-produced wines, they're pretty much going to taste the same every year. And that's just so boring for our palate, to be honest with you. But um, the current Trebbiano that we have uh, tastes of sort of lemon flavors and melon flavors. Uh, depending on the, the vintage, Sometimes I get a little whiff of the sea on the aroma, and sometimes I get a little salty minerality on the finish, but it depends on the vintage. He only makes 6,000 bottles a year by hand. This is a micro batch. You are not going to find a wine made in such a small quantity for such an affordable price than you are right now in this class. I can promise you that. No one knows about this winery. Um, his wine is also unfiltered, so notice the golden color. It's a little bit cloudy. It's not as clear as some of the commercial wines that you've probably seen. That's a stylistic choice um, to not filter the wines. Um, uh, not filtering the wine means that basically um, just winemaking 101 here. When you're fermenting the wine, uh, the yeast eats the sugar and turns that sugar into alcohol. Well, what happens to the yeast after, after it converts the sugar to alcohol? Well, it dies. And so these little fragments um, end up uh, making the wine a little bit cloudy. You can't feel them on the palate at all. Um, they're, they're microscopic, but it gives a sort of cloudiness to the wine. Um, winemakers more naturalistic winemakers do that because it adds more flavor and depth to the wine. The big mass commercial wine producers are not going to make unfiltered wine because the grape quality is so bad that leaving in any, um, any residual from the yeast is going to make the wine taste like garbage, basically. So, um, these naturalistic winemakers like Emilio, they are so confident in their wine to leave it unfiltered because they know the quality of the grape is so high. But I would pair it with just light foods. And here's a picture of a young lady drinking the Trebbiano d'Abruzzo overlooking the Adriatic Sea in the town of Francavilla al Mare, which is where Emilio's uh, vineyard is located. Okay. Now we're going to go to the next wine. We're going to go to the Campania region in southern Italy. 
Now, Campania is famous for the metropolis, ancient city of Naples, the ancient Greek city of Paestum, the ancient city covered in lava, Pompeii, and also it is famous for the gorgeous Amalfi coastline. And this picture is a shot from the Amalfi coast. And if you look all the way in the back, there is uh, a shot of Mount Vesuvius, one of uh, uh, Europe's most dangerous volcanoes since it destroyed the entire city of Pompeii thousands of years ago. Um, what is interesting about the Campania region is that it completely resisted the French great varietal trends of the day. So you're not going to find Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. You're not going to find those wines in Campania. They have a very long history of cultivating their own local native grape varietals for thousands of years. And they're very passionate about their history and tradition and culture. So they're not going to change. We're going to go specifically to a medieval town called Taurasi, where the Antico Borgo winery is. And I just want to show you this statue here. The white wine we're about to taste was likely one of the favorite white wines of the Roman emperors 2000 years ago. Pliny the Elder, the Roman author, wrote that the Roman emperors felt that the best wines and the best grapes for winemaking were found in Campania. And so we know that this grape, the Fiano grape, is one of the oldest grapes native to Italy. It's called Fiano. And what makes this grape special is that it's age worthy. Most white wines go bad within two or three years after the harvest. Fiano can age in the bottle for 10 years, making it uh, a very unique grape varietal uh, that you're not going to find very often. What does Fiano taste like? Well, it, for me, it reminds me, if you ever had limoncello, it's that, it's that very bright, vivacious citrus notes that you get from limoncello without the sugar. And then there's this volcanic minerality on the finish. It's a very soft and smooth wine on the palate. The key to drinking this wine is also different from other wines, which is you don't want to ice this wine because if you ice it, you won't taste its nuanced flavors. It's a really uh, sophisticated wine. I think it was Leonardo da Vinci that said, um, what did he say? That sophistication is simplicity, something like that. And so uh, this wine, the Fiano di Avellino, uh, embodies that concept. You're better off drinking this wine at around 50 degrees. Uh, so, you know, you can refrigerate it, but I would pull it out 20 minutes or so before you have it to enjoy it the most. It becomes more aromatic as it starts to warm up. So the other thing is the flavor profile changes as the wine ages, it gets more complex. As it gets older, these little toasted almond notes on the finish start to develop, it, it becomes very savory. I mean, this is a dry white wine, but there's nothing bitter, there's nothing astringent. It, it's very tasty, it's very simple. Like the Trebbiano, it's a very delicate wine. So for those of you who are drinking Pinot Grigio wines, I would say Trebbiano, and possibly Fiano would be a nice transition wine for you to get into Italian wines. Um, in terms of pairings, you can see right there that I paired it with uh, pasta alla vongole, uh, which is clams, pasta with clams, olive oil, parsley, salt, pepper, and it's absolutely delicious. You can also pair this. This is an excellent pairing wine with oysters in the summer uh, and crab. I even recently discovered that uh, guacamole and chips, this is a fantastic wine to pair with, with uh, anything avocado based. Uh, the Antigo Borgo winery produces 10,000 bottles a year, another micro batch of wine. So only the highest quality grapes are used uh, for winemaking. It's a fascinating wine. And you might be wondering why is it called Fiano di Avellino? Avellino is 
the province city uh, of one of the province provincial cities of Campania. So this literally means Fiano from the town of Avellino, uh, which is, you know, a short ride from the Taurasi um, medieval town. Okay. And finally, this is the winemaker of the Fiano. This is Raffaele Inglese. Raffaele, is, <clears throat> he's not hugging a tree. He's hugging the oldest grapevine in Italy. It's over 260 years old. He's dedicated his entire life to cultivating native varietals from Campania. Very passionate. If you wanna learn about wine culture, these are the types of guys and gals that you need to study. Let's move on to the next white wine. We're gonna to go to the island of Sardinia. Now Sardinia or Sardegna in Italian is world famous as some of the most beautiful beaches in the world, as you can see. Sardinia is on the western part of the Italian peninsula. It's one of Italy's 20 regions. And the Atarulla winery, which we'll go over in a second, is found here in the Valle di Odoene, northeastern part of the island. Sardinia is also famous uh, for its archaeological sites. There was a uh, people called the Neurogic people that existed on the island between 3,000 and 8,000 years ago. And for some reason, they just disappeared, and we don't know what happened to them, but they did leave a lot of archaeological sites for us to study then. And this is one of them. And etched in some of the stones that you'll find in these sites is this symbol on the right. This was their mother goddess. Um, this was a statue made out of marble almost 6,000 years ago that was found at one of these sites. So as you can imagine, food and farming was of the highest priority in those days, no irrigation no farming technology. It was all about the soil and the climate. So the Neurogic people worshiped their mother goddess uh, to bless them with fertile crops. This is a picture of a Neurogic refrigerator, prehistoric underground. And these group of scientists discovered uh, some prehistoric grape seeds that date back over 3000 years, which led to a very recent discovery that Sardinia is probably the oldest wine culture in the Mediterranean, and it goes all the way back to the Neurogic period. This is uh, the Atarulla Vineyard. Uh, this is the uh, Valle di Odoene. This, is, this means Valley of God, because the, they called it the Valley of God because this is the most fertile soil in Sardinia, and there's only one wine producer in this valley, the Atarulla winery. And so now we're going to taste a Vermentino, Vermentino di Sardegna. Vermentino, uh, while it is found on the Italian peninsula, uh, I believe the Tuscans and Liguria, they make Vermentino wines. Uh, the best Vermentino wines are coming out of uh, the island of Sardinia. Only 6,000 bottles a year. Notice on the label, the mother goddess symbol um, blessing the land for fertile crops. And I paired this uh, with some spaghetti with, as you can see, there's a, a sea scallop and shrimp. And then this little um, topping here is, it's not, it's not red pepper, it's botarga. Botarga is uh, a dried uh, fish egg. Um, don't get grossed out. It's actually quite tasty. It's dried fish eggs. And instead of like grating cheese, which is sort of a sin in Italy to grate, put grated cheese on top of a, a seafood pasta dish, um, you grate this botarga, dried fish egg, uh, on top. And it's delicious paired with the Vermentino. This is a very, very unique wine at 6,000 bottles a year. Um, beautiful nose. Um, you can really chill this if you want. It still gives off a beautiful bouquet. Um, you know, medium to full bodied, very buttery texture, long finish. 
Um, it's an excellent wine with or without food, but it's unique tasting. I, I would I would tend to err on the side of eating with it because it's just so complex. It will really um, excite your palate with whatever you're eating. And here's another pairing. Uh, this is a regional pairing. This is a very famous dish in Sardinia. It's called pasta a la Carlo Fortina. And what it is is short pasta. Typically they use trofie, um, but I didn't have it that day. I had the uh, cavatelli pasta. And it's got tuna, a little bit of cherry tomato, and pesto, uh, along with uh, chopped onion. And it is delicious, trust me. Beautiful, traditional, regional pairing with the vermentino. Excellent, excellent meal. And here's me, uh, thumbs up while I was cooking it. Um, it. Actually, it's one of my favorite pasta dishes. Now we're going to go to Sicily to taste another white wine. Now, Sicily is the beating heart of the Mediterranean. Uh, big island, triangular island, right smack in the middle of it. Now, Sicily is famous for its beaches. It's famous for eggplant parmesan. It's famous for the cannoli and ricotta cheese. It's even famous for the Godfather movies. But what it's not known for necessarily are mountains. And so way up in the Madunier Mountains in north central Sicily, about 1,500 to 3,000 feet above sea level, we have these secret vineyards uh, from the Castel Lucimiano estate, literally in a world of its own. The Madunier Mountains is this orange section, north central Sicily. Once you get down the mountain, you've got about a 35 minute ride to Palermo, just to give you a sense of where it is. And the next wine we're gonna taste is made with 100% Catarato. I should mention also at this point that I didn't mention it earlier, all of the wines that I'm speaking about in this class, they're all mono varietals, all single grape varietal wines, 100%. There are no blends. None of these wines are blends. I want you to taste the essence of a single varietal from an artisanal producer so you can really taste the, the potential of how good wines can actually be. This is probably the biggest production wine that I have for you today, 40,000 bottles a year. But this is an amazing, amazing wine. This is the best Catarato in Sicily. Catarato is, uh, it literally means uh, cataract in Italian, which describes the, the legs of the wine. You know, when you swirl it and, uh, you know, the legs can be a little bit bubbly but it happens as the wine gets closer to room temperature, you know, if you're still drinking on it. But you can drink this wine chilled and iced, no problem. It's extremely aromatic, uh, high acidity, um, very, very crispy, medium bodied, very fruity on the front with a clean finish on the back. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing wine. This is the one that won the double gold medals that I was telling you about. It's a phenomenal wine. I've been drinking it for years. Um, let's see. Let's look at this picture. Uh, this is a pairing, another pairing. This is with the Catarato. They nicknamed the bottle Miano, by the way. Um, and this is a pairing with uh, baked cod, olive oil, salt, pepper, uh, garlic, um, parsley. And I threw on some broccoli rabe and some zucchini. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal pairing. Um, you know, this might be uh, the best white wine for the money in Southern Italy today. I've been all over the island tasting wines constantly. This, this is up there. This, is, this wine's tough to beat. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into Catarato because there's another one coming up. I'll explain what I mean. This is uh, Catarato growing on an ancient vine. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, as you can see, it looks like a little tree. In Italian, they call this alberello. This is a type of vine that you will never see in Napa Valley. You will never see in Tuscany, for that matter. Alberello is a vine that's been uh, practiced since ancient times. It has been known to make the highest quality grapes. 
The problem is it's a lot of hard work cultivating this way. You have to use scissors and hands. There is no way a tractor can pass through and chop those grapes off. This happens to be a 70 year old vine of Catarato, which in vine years is very old. Um, in terms of winemaking, you don't really find too many places that are uh, making wines from uh, 100 year old vines. That's sort of the maxing out point for, for vine life. But uh, the Albarello method is um, it's been known for millennia to make the best grapes. And so this is a picture of the crew vineyard of Catarato from the Castel Lucimiano vineyard. Um, as you can see, they're budding right now. So it's uh, springtime, but this is about 3000 feet above sea level on a flat plain. And I'm gonna show you the wine that they make from this. This is uh, once the canopies start growing in the same place. Beautiful. Look, there's no way a tractor can come in here and make wine. You literally need um, some hardworking people to come in and cut the grapes off, but it's totally worth it. This is a picture of the crew of Catarato. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the top Catarato in Sicily. There is no other. There is no other. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Mount Etna, uh, the traditional Mount Etna Bianco wines are a blend of two grapes. Catarato is one of them. There are some producers that are making single varietal Catarato wines in uh, Mount Etna, but I assure you, none of them can beat this wine. This is called Shara. A shara is a nickname for another word, Sharazzi, which is the name of that vineyard that I just showed you. This is Sharazzi, just a nickname for the plot from where the Catarato grapes are uh, grown. They only make 12,000 bottles a year. This is a superior, superior wine. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of pairings. This was uh, with a chef friend of mine who paired this with quail eggs, asparagus, and some potatoes. Very simple, um, fantastic pairing. And this was one of my New Year's Eve pairings. This is um, uh, white fish, uh, sea bass. It's Chilean sea bass, actually, baked in the oven. Uh, olive oil, garlic, um, salt, pepper, parsley and some uh, sea scallops and asparagus. Absolutely delicious. Best of the best white wine. Um, one of the most common things I hear from people when they're complimenting, whether it's the Miano or the Shara, both of these different Catarato wines, is that they always say this, I'm a red wine drinker, but I, and I love this wine. I hear it all the time. Okay, now let's go to rosés and we'll be uh, getting to the end of this. So rosés, what do the different colors of rosé mean, right? You walk into a wine shop and there's rosés with all these different colors. And some people think that the darker ones represent sweeter wines and the light pink ones represent the dry crisp wines. And the truth is, is that that's not a safe shortcut. Um, that's not really how it works. Um, they get their color based on which grape varietals they're using and how long the juice sits on the skins. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But that's what's determining the color, which grape they're using and how long the juice is sitting on the skins. It just, I just wanted to illustrate with some real bottles all the variations of color for rosé wines. Now, rosé wines should exist for one reason only, which is to, to have a very light and refreshing uh, wine experience. It's simply as that. Um, I find that the best Italian rosés are similar to the lightest red wines you could find. That's just my experience. When it comes to Italian rosé, there's really only two regions you need to look at. 
I mean, I've been tasting rosés all over Italy. And from one producer to the next, you know, you might find a good rosé here or there. But I really, based on my experience, I couldn't really say that, you know, when I go to uh, Tuscany, for example, every rosé that I come across is phenomenal. I can't say that. Uh, in terms of which regions make the best rosé that stand out for just from my experience, you know, and this is my experience and my opinion, the best rosés are coming from two regions. One is Abruzzo and the other one is Puglia. So if you wanted to limit your explorations and just focus on those two regions, I guarantee you'll find some phenomenal rosés. The only caveat is that they're hard to find um, in the States. They haven't really taken off. So I'm gonna share with you one rosé from the Abruzzo region. And we're coming full circle here. Remember Emilio Rapino that made the Trebbiano d'Abruzzo? This is his rosé. And it's called Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo. Cerasuolo. Now what's interesting about this rosé is that it's made from 100% Montepulciano grapes. And so how does he make this rosé? Well, after the harvest of the multiple channel grapes, the juice sits, basically he harvests the first day. And then that night, um, there's a light press and the juice sits on the skins for 12 hours, which is basically overnight. So if you've ever read any of the wine books, they'll tell you, you know, when, uh, when you squeeze the juice out of a red grape, it actually comes out looking like white wine. Red wines get its color because the juice sits on the skins for a very long period of time. Um, some wines sit on the skins for a month to get uh, a dark red rich color. For rosés, it's much faster. And in particular, this wine, because I asked Emilio, he told me 12 hours, which is basically overnight, to get this color. And then he removes the juice from the skins. And that's how he does it. What does this wine taste like? Medium bodied. It's got these beautiful floral notes. Beautiful, beautiful floral notes. There's this orange, like orangey citrus, zesty crispiness on the back. And it's just super clean all the way. This is an addictive, addictive wine. You can drink it with food. You can drink it without food. Um, springtime, summertime um, is best. But I also find that it works really well during Thanksgiving time. It's an excellent uh, turkey pairing wine as well, which I love that for. So even in the fall, you can continue drinking it. This was an awesome pairing. I was eating crabs at home and pairing it with the Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo. And by the way, Cerasuolo in Italian means pink. The real word is rosa. But Cerasuolo is used sometimes in wine to describe a certain pink hue. And that pink hue is illustrated. Notice how in the bottle it's much darker than it is in the glass. Interesting, right? So uh, long story short, don't let the color of a rosé influence what you think it might taste like. This is dry, clean, fruity, floral, zesty. It's an awesome wine. 6,000 bottles a year. It's a micro batch. Just wanted to share one more pairing with you. This is grilled octopus with uh, oven roasted potatoes with some Old Bay on top. That was another awesome, awesome pairing with this rosé. Having a lot of fun with this rosé. It's delicious. And so to recap, uh, we tasted Vermentino from Sardinia, Fiano from Campania, Catarato, two different wines, the Miano and the Chara from the Castellucci Vineyard, Trebbiano d'Abruzzo from Emilio Rapino, and then the Cerasuolo Rosé, which comes from the Montepulciano grape. And so finally, you might be wondering, how do wines that require so much physical labor, like getting on one's hands and knees and manually har hand harvesting grapes could result in a wine between 20 and 25 bucks? I mean, don't you think a wine that was made by hand, you'd think it'd be worth more than 25, right? Of course, I mean, as long as the wine's good, right? So there are three reasons why uh, the wines that I'm sharing with you 
in this class are so affordable. One is these wineries don't spend money on advertising like the big wineries do. So, you know, when you go to a wine shop and you buy a bottle of Santa Margarita Pinot Grigio for 25 bucks, you're not paying for the quality. You're paying for the advertising. You're in effect giving them money so that they can advertise back to you. That's why everyone knows about that wine, as an example. Uh, the other reason is, as the importer, I really work hard with the producer to help me uh, price the wine so that it would be attractive for my audience. Uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll be a part of that in the future. And the third reason why these wines are so affordable is this community. What they don't tell you about some of these uh, smaller vineyards as well is that the community helps out for the harvest time and it's a volunteer service. Of course, they have some people that they have on the payroll to uh, take care of the land, but when it comes to harvest time, you need a lot of people and it's a community activity and the people love doing it. They go out with their friends, they're out under the sun, great weather, beautiful grapes, vineyards are beautiful places to be at. Um, you know, it's just a fun, healthy activity for the community to get together, families and friends from all ages, from little babies participating in the harvest to uh, senior citizens. Everyone likes to be a part of this activity. A lot of times there's a pork roast or a festival after the harvest, and that's more fun, as you can imagine. So people love doing it. Um, so I would, I would say that when it comes to great wines, whether it's summer or winter, there's more in a great bottle of wine than just delicious flavors. It's the origin, it's the craftsmanship, and it's the people that make it possible. So, you know, I, I would ask you to keep that in mind while you're sipping on a glass of vino. And so if you'd like to know how you can get the wines that I've talked about in this class, I've put together a couple of uh, packages for you, actually three packages. You have three options. You can purchase a six pack of all the wines that we tasted. You'll get for the six pack, um, two rosés. I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, or you, you have the option of getting a full case of 12 bottles. So your, your bottle price actually, if you were to do the math, your, your bottle price goes down quite a bit if you were to get the 12 case. But for those of you who just would like to sample and explore, the Summer 6 sample pack is a, is a good option. Let me show you a picture. These are the wines in the six pack and 12 pack, but this is specifically what you would get in the six pack. You'll get the Trebbiano d'Abruzzo from Emilio Rapino. You're gonna get two of his rosés, which you're definitely gonna need. Vermentino from Sardinia, the Fiano di Avellino, uh, the Emperor's White Wine. <laughs> and then you'll get one bottle of Miano, the uh, Catarato. Now, uh, for the 12 bottle pack, you'll get two Trebbianos, you'll get three of the Rosés, you'll get two Vermentino, you'll get two Fianos, and you'll get three of the Miano Catarato. And on top of that, um, I'll give you an option if you wanted to swap out one of these bottles, uh, which it'll be the rosé, we can swap out one bottle of rosé if you wanted to bump up and get the shara. Uh, so I'll leave that as an option. There's also the premium pack, uh, where if you'd like to just have the best of the best of the best and no other, you can get six bottles of the shara cru catarato the best Catarato in Sicily uh, for $235. Taxes and shipping is included. So I just want to recap. You have three options uh, to pick up your summer Italian wines from small artisanal uh, producers. There's the summer six pack. There's the summer collection of 12 bottles. Or you can just get the premium pack, which is six bottles of the Shara. So just to uh, remind you, these are all hand harvested, hand selected grapes, clean farming, only the highest quality grapes are used for winemaking, 100% native Italian grape varietals produced and bottled at the origin to enhance quality even more. 
the quality of these wines, I'm telling you, uh, they are worth way more than the price. But the production is limited. So if you think you're interested in exploring this, you should place your order now. We don't ship to these states, just in case you're wondering. Uh, we do not ship to any of these states, but we ship to over 40 states in the US. If you have any questions, um, you can write to me, Tony at italianwines.nyc. And to order the wines, all you have to do is go to italianwines.nyc slash summer. And when you go to italianwines.nyc slash summer, you'll see these three options here. You'll see the summer six pack, the summer 12 bottle collection, and then the option for the premium pack. And for the first two options, if you wanted to swap out a bottle so that you can try a bottle of Shara, um, that will be available on this webpage as well. All you have to do is go to italianwines.myc slash summer. Thanks for listening. Keep in touch. I'm also on Instagram. So if you want to see more wine and food pairings, I'm always posting those all the time. Just go to Gladiator Wine on Instagram. And if you have Facebook, just go to facebook.com slash gladiator wine. And I post all of my pairings there and, and little wine videos as well. So um, final time, you can pick up one of these options here. Just go to italianwines.myc slash summer. I'm Tony Margiata. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you on the next video. Ciao.